Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this first traditional jazz drummers round table. And tonight we have a selection of five tracks, five great drummers from across the years, and five of us drummers who are going to discuss, dissect, and give our opinions on them. So I'm going to let the guys introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Dorn. I'm in New York City, and what can I say? I'm a jazz drummer who is influenced by people like Gene Krupa and George Wetling and Cliff Lehman and Dave Tuff and all these great drummers. And I'm just uh, trying to learn how to keep time and swing. That's what I'm doing. This is Hal Smith from Searcy, Arkansas, and uh, as Kevin said, I'm influenced by the great drummers of the past, and I'm a huge admirer of all the great drummers that I'm on this program with today. I'm Jack Amblin. I'm uh, living in Leeds in the UK, which is in the north of England. And yeah, like everyone else, I guess, just uh, I like a lot of the guys from the 20s, 30s and 40s. And I, I actually like a bit of early rock and roll as well, which uh, may not be all right. I don't know, but I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs>
And I'm uh, Josh Duffy from Big Spiderbeck's hometown of Davenport, Iowa. So it's a pleasure to say that. <laughs> so I uh, grew up in uh, Moline, Illinois, which was hometown to the great Louis Belson and was friends with Louis for many, many years. Uh, but my influence oh, really yeah. drummers of the 20s, 30s and 40s. And there's so many that are um, under that umbrella of those decades. And just I'm going to reiterate what Hal said. It's just an honor to be here with all the other uh, percussionists and drummers on the program. And we're just going to have a fun time with the recordings. And it's just the tip of the iceberg for the accomplishments that these drummers did so many years ago. Thank you, Josh. Well, I'm John Petters. I'm in Long Sutton in Lincolnshire on the eastern coast of England. I've been influenced by the same drummers that all these guys have been influenced by and thoroughly enjoy the music. And I admire the drumming of all of these fellow people on this forum this evening. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to each introduce the track that we've chosen, just say a few words about it, then I'll play the track and then we will take it apart afterwards and see what we all think about and what we've heard and what we picked up and what we've noticed. The best way that I could come up with to do this was to do it in the chronological order of the recording dates of the tracks. So. I guess the first one goes to you, Josh. So would you like to take over? Yeah, wonderful. Um, the, the, the track that I picked, again, it's so hard as all of us were deciding, like, which track do we pick or which two tracks? There's just so many great ones. And I had to um, go with my number one track for one of my all-time favorite drummers, Chauncey Morehouse. And a lot of people know who he is, but a lot of people don't know who Chauncey is. And uh, the first thing with him is he was a left-handed drummer. And so when you're hearing him play, he was left-handed, not right-handed. So I have an interview of him talking about his drumming days and was saying, 
who did you learn from? And his answer was, I really couldn't watch anybody because I had to reverse everything that they were doing. And one of the songs that has really inspired me over the years has been Harlem Twist, which is by Red Nichols and his orchestra. And it's a it's a hot side because you have a brass section of Leo McConville, uh, Red Nichols and Myth Bowl who are just smoking and it sounds incredible especially when you hear Mip on some of these parts. Um, but then you had um, Fudd Livingston, you had Arthur Shutt, you had Joe Tardo, you had Dudley Fosdick on mellophone. Um, but what's neat is that you have Chauncey Morehouse on drums, vibraphone, and vocals on this. And before the vocals come in for four bars, you'll hear a, the drums stop, then he starts doing his scat singing. And then about three and a half bars after the vocals are done, you hear him come back in with that bass drum hit. And so it's just a really hot side. And a lot of people know this recording, but again, there's probably some out there that haven't heard it, but when you hear it, it just, it's just bleeds red nickels in that style of music that he produced back then. So here we go with Harlem Twist by Red Nichols and his orchestra. And what year is this, uh, Josh? It should have been uh, 1928. <laughs> What did you think of that? Well, one thing I want to, Josh, do you think, is he playing at least a lot of the time, is he playing four on the bass drum? Because it, it sounds to me like the drums, one of the things, I don't know if he's doing that, but one of the things I love from back then is sometimes when the drums are in four and the bass instrument is in two. And that kind of right. sounded like the feel to me there, but I, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, Carl Kress is on guitar, and, and I know I mentioned Tardo, and that's he. I know he's on Hell's recording. There's all this red nickels going around. Um, I think he's on a, a very light four because he's also using brushes at the beginning. You can hear when he switches to sticks behind Miff Mold doing um, the part there, and so that he got that light four just without a bass instrument there. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Is that you can kind of hear that that low pulse, but with with Carl Kress just chunking it out there. Um, just yeah, that's a that's a great point. Well, that, that's just one of my 
that's the main thing that, that stuck out to me because I just love that feel. And I feel that that's something that's been kind of lost in jazz that, that nowadays the rules are always whatever the bass instrument is doing, whether it's a string bass or a tuba or whatever, <clears throat> whatever the bass is doing, the drums should match. And in general, sure, but it wasn't always the case back then. And there's, I think, a lot of examples in the 20s and 30s and the 40s of the bass in two and the drums in four. And it's just a feel that I love that I, I think has been kind of lost. And that, that, that was just the main thing that stuck out to me there. And of course, all that great choke cymbal work that, that you know, I, I've heard you do that so well, Josh. And, and that always, it's just great. And that it's, it's, you know, the way he plays, it's just so innovative. And uh, I agree is that when you have a lot of drummers today, even what they're being taught in school is even say, oh, don't use the bass drum, just drop bombs here and there. But it's that soft feathering the bass drum with the with the bass instrument that just really has that low end just moving along and swinging along there. Yeah, absolutely. So just what, the one other thing I want to ask you, Josh, that that choke symbol that he's playing, do you know what size symbol that was or what do you think it was? It sounds like a 12 that he's playing. I know he would play anywhere from a 10 to a 12, and I've got a 14 that I use, and that's very similar to what Burton would use. But with Chauncey, he had a little bit more of that higher pitch, and, I, and I've seen pictures, and it's about a 12 inch that he has there. And I actually own one of his chokes, and there it's a really thick symbol, and it's about 10 inches. And wow. it's when I it, 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 it kind of gave that sound, but again, it was like, oh my gosh, when I hit it, you, you thought your stick was gonna break, it was that thick, so. Of of all the recordings of that um, of these kind of ear ones, I thought that symbol sounded the most like a hi hat. Actually, I was I was going to ask like, oh wow, it's like that can't have been a hi hat, but it's really maybe it was just the way it was recorded as well. But uh, right. it's actually not a hi hat. It's actually so thin um, because I can get that sound on my fourteen as well. And so you just have to find that right thickness of the symbol, and it just gives you that sound. But it's also how he would hit. He'd kind of hit, and then he wouldn't go all the way through. He'd kind of pull his arm back. You can even see uh, videos of him with Roger Wolf Khan where he kind of hits, and it's kind of a pullback. So that he makes has sense. all these different like arm motions, and I've tried to like study his sound, and I'm like like contorting myself all over the place. It's like, oh, that's what Chauncey did. Okay, because you're, you're just trying to get that sound. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because yeah, say that like because you can obviously it's what I like about. I mean, you can do it on a hi hat as well. But what I like about some of the choke symbol stuff is that you can control how long the cymbal notes are. You know, which isn't isn't something you normally think about with cymbals nowadays. Like a lot of other, or you know, or even even later jazz drummers, just like the cymbal is the sustained sound to hit right. and carry over something. Whereas you can choke it and control the length. But I think my, you must be right. Maybe at dragging that stick across the cymbal, it it, sat, it nearly sounded to me on that recording like two cymbals meeting. Which is probably where I was like, oh, it can't be the hi hat, but that's the closest I've ever heard to a, a hi hat sound. You know, amazing. Yeah, it all boils down to physics too, with how he's coming at the angle, how hard he's hitting, and. Yeah, yeah different motions it's like i've actually tried to study like what's it sound like if i move my arm all these different degrees on that symbol and different as strengths i'm hitting it an attack and so it's like wow and that's like some people think oh it's so just a choke symbol it's like yeah there's so much with just a choke symbol that you can get all these different sounds out of it right, that, that's a that's a great point josh just when, when you hear some yeah like a lot of people they just think oh a choke symbol you're just doing this one thing but when you hear a master like that it's the, it's the same and Jack, I also agree. It sounded like like a hi hat, and it's the same kind of thing when you hear someone like Joe Jones or Dave Tuff play an entire tune on a hi hat, but they get all these different effects from it. And yeah, it's the yeah. same thing. A lot of those drummers, they could play at least on a recording a choke cymbal through the whole thing, but get so many different variations: a tight sound and a sustained sound. And you can just, you know, it never becomes, you know, it's just they they get every effect that they need out of that one thing. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say that he sounds different to how I hear him playing on the Bix recordings. And I'm wondering if that's because this is a Victor recording as opposed to the Bix by the Bex being OKs. And we know from the, the situation with Krupa that OK were not keen on full drum kits. So I'm guessing the impression that we get on the Bix and his gang sides and those records from that period don't actually do him justice. W would you go along with that, Josh? 
yeah, when he when he's on those OK sides, he's very active, very musical, um, uh, very more active behind Bix and behind all the musicians when he's playing. With this, um, he's taking more probably of that arrangement with Bix and the guys. They have their arrangement we're playing. I know that there's a written arrangement of this song of Harlem Trist, Twist, so he was actually reading the chart and adding in everything. And I'm sure, too, he had a lot on his mind thinking, OK, I have to do the brushes at the beginning, then I got to switch to choke, then I got to stop do my singing, come back to sticks, and then grab the mallets to play the vibe part. <laughs> so he's very active. And so when there's a lot on our minds, you don't want to get pads one and two crossed and all of a sudden you're doing something wrong because there goes the take for the day. So sometimes it's better to be a little bit more simple on a recording and effective than be busy and make a mistake. I was just saying, I love, I'd never, I wouldn't even thought that was the same guy doing all that, like doing the scat as well. And like on top, and that even that style of scat's interesting. It's like early, isn't it? It's like very. It's, it's almost like a horn line scatting, really. But um, oh. and I love the idea of like. So where do you say this is? Twenty eight. So yeah. yeah, like um, they were they were. Uh, are we on? Are we on electric recording yet in twenty eight? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like um, yeah. So you have got some mics there, but, but probably only one in that room, right? So like, I love that. How I wonder. I'd love to have seen what the setup in that was, and how f he would have to move forward to do that. I just love that. that you, once you said that, you can visualize the room and like all the things you must have done in that room as well. Amazing, amazing. Well, I oh, think yeah. they may have had more than one microphone because they, they there was uh, early mixers on some of those uh, early recordings, I believe. Right. Still wouldn't have been the same mic on his drums and that scat though. I no. Thought, no. <laughs> One thing I was going to say that I noticed, Josh, the Louisiana Rhythm Kings series of recordings. Is it yes. Chauncey on the early ones of those or Vic Burton? I believe it's Vic Burton uh, because I've, I've been listening to those and I have some of those sides here. Yeah. Um, I don't think I did much with them. I think it was more of Vic Burton. And then, of course, Krupa was in. And yeah. I love fun drums of Lady Be Good when he plays with them. Um, but yeah, primarily um, with Chauncey, he did some work with Red Nichols, but then he got work with NBC and yeah. was working radio there. And so um, his his dates of playing with a bunch of the musicians like this, just side dates, started to diminish and because he had more of the studio work because he had a family, too. And so he was wanting to have that steady work for the family. Yeah, because I hear a similarity in approach between those two drummers, and it's interesting to listen to the, the, the Louisiana Rhythm Kings chronologically, because when Vic Burton leaves, Dave Tuff comes in, and you get an altogether different feel rhythmically, and then Krupa comes in, and it's, and it's, more, it, it's Dave Tuff on overdrive almost, right, <laughs> in right. that sense. And, and and that's what the neat thing is with all these uh, different drummers we're listening to is when that drummer came into the band, they kind of set that style and the, and the dynamic for the group. And that's why I was telling my students, hey, that the drummer really does control what the band does. You've got great players, but if the drummer is off stylistically or isn't swinging the band, that can really affect the whole unit there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. What happened to Chauncey in, in later years then? Um, he worked all the way, uh, I think, through the 50s with NBC and had his own orchestra in the late 30s and was also with Lee Stevens Saturday Night Swing Club Orchestra. And uh, then he just started um, uh, doing like some freelance work uh, from the 50s on. And uh, once all the uh, the big stuff happened in the early 70s, then he started attending these reunion concerts and and performing with all the gold kept men again. And uh, they stayed in touch all the way until each one of them just passed away. And it, I think that was one of the neatest things that it shows the the brotherhood and how much all these musicians got along with one another stayed in touch over all these years and consider each other family. And yeah. I think that's what music so great is we meet each other and this, we become this little family and we stay in touch for all these years. Yeah, that's great. Well, we've got Hal back with us. Um, Hal, I don't know how much of the, of the track or the conversation you've heard, but if you're able to, would you like to comment on, um, on Chauncey? Now, I didn't hear the track at all, I'm sorry to say. Oh, it was, a I, new, it was a new take I found. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'll make a general comment on Chauncey's playing, though, if I may. Uh, I, I think of Chauncey and also Vic Burton as reactive drummers, as opposed to Stan King, who I think of as a proactive drummer. I, I listen to Chauncey and Vic Burton, and they're, they're kind of dancing along with the horns and the the inner rhythms that the the band's playing. That 
like what Hoagie Carmichael described as sock time. And uh, that's how I think of Vic and, and Chauncey Morehouse playing, as opposed to Stan King, who just came charging in with press <laughs> rolls and rim shots and cross sticks and uh, sometimes four beat on the bass drum. But that's one of the charming things about uh, the Chauncey Morehouse sound that I like so much. It's so easygoing and so relaxed. And he doesn't play a lot, but he plays just the right thing at the right time. Like yep. the uh, cymbal accents on Clementine with, with the Gold Cat Band or the woodblock on the out chorus of Jazz Band Ball with Bix. It's, it's so... Uh, so refined and so quiet and so thoughtful, but it's always right. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, and any closing comments on uh, Chauncey, Josh? Um, I mean, it's as I said, uh, he thought he played his, and this is from an interview with him. He thought he played his best with Paul Specht in his orchestra because he's like, I had my freedoms to do what I wanted, and when I'm hearing the interview, I'm thinking, well, I thought. Some of your best recordings were with Vix and his gang, with Red Nichols. And, but what I wouldn't have, I would have paid billions of dollars to have seen him drum with Adrian Rolini's New Yorkers. I mean, that, oh my gosh, that outfit would have been incredible. And I know the close, one of the closest we can get to that is listening to Crying All Day by Frank Trumbauer's orchestra, because it's pretty much the same instrumentation and musicians that were in that group. And when I hear that, I just get chills every time I hear it. But I, I mean, I agree with what everybody has said here about his drumming and it's just great to bring his name to life again and keep his legacy going because he was so important in the 20s, but then also the 30s and 40s when there were so many other great drummers. Um, and I just got to mention how great it was hearing Fudd Livingston on clarinet and tenor sax. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's just it's a who's who in that in that ensemble. So. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Thank, thank you very much, Josh, for that. That was a new track for me. I'd not heard it before and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's given me a, a little bit more of an insight on Chauncey that I hadn't quite realised. So thank you for that. Well, we yeah. now hand it over to Jack. And Jack, would you like to tell us a bit about the track that you've picked and why you've picked it? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I'm sure you all know this guy. I think you, you guys are all much more authorities on uh, some of this stuff than I am, but um, it's great to get your opinion on stuff. And I, so I, I've chosen this Ray Baduke track, or, the, or Bob, Bob Crosby, I should say, but because um, I've been doing some transcriptions of some just kind of drummers that stood out to me. I mean, years ago now, after meeting John, and John helped me out a lot with loads of some great recordings. Every, I think I've told you this before, John, but those, those like all those discs you gave me of those bands, like loads of them I hadn't heard of. And then I was just doing some research and just into, into stuff where I heard something or trying to find this drummer. And I was like, I wonder who this is. And then it, 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 undoubtedly it's on that disc you gave me. <laughs> and it's on there somewhere. So it's been, there's still, I still got them. I still look every, every couple of months, I still go into it and have a look. So it's amazing really. But, um, so yeah, so this big big crash, um, I I transcribed it because I like I really the, the, what really struck me about his playing when I first heard it was like I don't know if you guys would agree, but it's it's really contrapuntal compared to a lot of other guys playing, but somehow doesn't get in the way as well. It's like it's very he's very busy on blocks and bells and and still does like tricky cymbal stuff even into into the 40s when it's not in fashion anymore um but it's still so he but he plays all these patterns but they somehow don't get in the way of the other musicians and i also really like um of of this era of music well, of every era i guess but i like the guys that kind of entertain as well and put a bit of a show and re and you know hence why the other track i do is like a papa joe one so i think he's the same as like amazing player but also like a bit a bit comedic and puts bits into it into the um and just playing that isn't solely based on the oral it's like uh, it's visual as well um so yeah there's just a couple i think you all know this track so it's, it's pretty famous anyway but the bits i thought to look out for were um uh i've got some written down there so like he does some cool um accents like playing sticks on the bass drum there's like some again from like some double uh, hanging over from some double drumming which isn't that common really um as time goes on um he's also i wonder on this recording i wonder how well it was all like rehearsed because he hits some there's like a trombone slide that he hits perfectly with it with a symbol and i was talking about like um 
choking the symbol at the right point when that trombone note ends and it's like so i wonder how you know loads of the supposed to the top line stuff is supposed to be kind of improvised on the spot but i wonder how much they stuck to what they kind of agreed because he, he hits it perfectly um and again there's like his off beats that he, and he chose, chose a wood block do some off beats which is like interesting rather than a, a choke symbol again um and the other th just general thing about him as well i think that this track it, it might have been the way it's recorded as well but he's he's a pretty quiet player like i know it's like he had there's some things he had some of his drums had like wood hoops as well rather than metal and i don't i'm not sure about this recording but like i know that will affect some of the kind of the rim shot sounds but i also think if there's he never really gets massively loud on on this track but it ends with him doing a little fade out like stick on stick on the snare drum so i think it's interesting he's a really dynamic drummer as well here comes Big Crash from China by Bob Crosby's Bobcats. crash from china ray baduk with bob crosby's bobcat right jack what would you like to say about that track that we've just listened to i think i said it in the introduction really and i'm sure you guys all all know that track but um i just think it's a great i i don't know if i'm talking out of turn but i think he's very unique in his like approach to it i find him very easy to um differentiate from from other other players um just as i said it's just really contrapuntal and like you know even talking about block work or something like for the the first guys i'm aware of do it like the block work that i could identify as like baby dodd stuff um or like or like zitty singles and stuff but they're like bit um ray badukes is is completely different style to that and he doesn't he doesn't do a lot of he doesn't do a lot of kind of cross rhythms but it's all very busy and there's like there's that that fast section in that that's like it's kind of like three over four but in sex tuplets and also he rushes like hell on that bit when i was trying to describe it i was like oh my god try this i ended up just because the setup i had I ended up having to play it le left-handed as well because trying to what i find sometimes hard about when you're listening to these recordings you know if they've like 
if the pitch has slipped a little bit, I'm listening and I was like, oh, has he got a third cowbell in there or like a third tom or is the, has the pitch just shifted a bit? So I end up trying to make what I can out of transcribing it. But um, yeah, I just think, and like the the bells as well, I he does a lot of drags on cowbells, which I don't think is very common compared to most of the other kind of traps players that, that we hear. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you guys have had some good comments on it as well, but that's that's what I kind of take from it. Okay, Kevin, would you like to go? Sure. I mean, well, I mean, that's just a virtuoso performance that that blows my mind every time I hear it. <laughs> and uh, I, I love that that whole the 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 beginning that that whole stick on stick and that you know he sort of frames it with that, like you said, Jack. He starts with that and kind of ends with that. And just I just love that kind of thing. That also reminds me of Cliff Lehman and Krupa would do that sometimes. And just as soon as I hear that sound, I get a I get a big smile on my face and. <laughs> Yeah, you're right, Jack. He just has, I always thought about Ray Baduk, and one of the things I love so much about this music was just how all these players had their own thing going on. And Ray Baduk, his drums don't sound like anyone else's drums. And you mentioned the wood hoops, Jack, and that could be part of it. It's just he's, he has his own sound, and he just gets such a great sound. And you had mentioned how sometimes he's very busy, but it doesn't get in the way. And I think for me, it seems like like the reason might be, well, first, his great feel. He, he just has such a, a great feel. But then he also has such a beautiful sound. And I think that sometimes with drums, drummers sometimes don't think about sound the way other instruments do. If you're playing a horn and it's just kind of obvious that you have to get a good sound on the instrument. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. with drummers, that's not quite as obvious and he just gets such a great sound which i think is primarily his touch but then also the the symbols and equipment that he picks but i think that goes a huge way to making something not get in the way even if it's busy if it's just a pleasing sound that's not abrasive and that doesn't clash with anything i think that really helps with that and i just i just love the sound and feel that ray baduk gets I, I think you're right as well. I think he, I think he definitely pays attention to sound and like tone as well. I mean, I think we all like, I, I like using like, I use a lot of calfskin heads now because trying to reproduce these. And like, I think the tone you can get from them is, is amazing. And that comes across in that. But also what I find quite interesting about his drums as well, he kit, there was a kit he still had out in, I think it was 59, this like Ludwig kit. And it's just, it's, he's still playing like a four piece with some traps on it and a splash, but it's like a, it's like an 18 inch bass drum. Like you think how strange that is coming from. It's not like it's not like a bop thing going from, uh, uh, you know, essentially the, the the four piece Krupa kit that is now the normal. He's he hasn't gone with that, but he's but the, he's still got these run and they're off. They're also like eleven inch size toms and stuff. He's like f some odd size toms, but it's just bit smaller. The bass drum's got smaller, but like it's yeah, it's like so. I think I hadn't thought about it, but what you just said there, I think yeah, I think he's very aware of sounds and tones that he likes, and that's probably feeds into why he comes up with a, a set like that lovely josh yeah uh just um <clears throat> when i again when i hear that i also think of like early baby dodds too because i know baby do, did solos like that with the wood blocks and cowbells and um it, it's very beautiful to hear that uh one thing i know with ray badu too and i've seen him on video as i'm sure everybody else has too is that he has like a silk towel that he drapes over his his tom toms from time to time to give a little bit more of that subtle sound so it's not uh, the much of the attack hitting the drum this i remember seeing like these silk towels and they either have a signature uh, like his uh, um rb like in, uh embroidered on it but i remember seeing that kind of draped over his drums i'm not sure if any of you guys have seen that as well but that, that always stuck out in my mind for uh capturing a sound that could kind of not be as bright and just a little bit more laid back and that would probably go with this light touch too getting around the drums there no, I I, well, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't noticed that still gets you, but I'm going to look out for that again. Again, I think that's amazing, and I think again that's that probably again just feeding into like a tone thing, really, because that's probably going to take out some of the overtones as well. Like, so that's yeah, super interesting. No, I'll, I'll look out for that. Okay, how? He, uh, Ray Baduke had some interesting equipment that we can hear on that recording too. The ratchet that uh, the older New Orleans drummers played, and the Greco symbols mounted on the rims. Uh, Gene Krupa 
played those, and uh, Zudi had one, Baby Dodds had one. I don't recall actually hearing them play it too much, but I was just uh, about to say that. I know Gene's famously got that like Greco Greco, let me say, yeah. but I, I, some people asked me that. I was like, what is that symbol? And I was like, well, I think it's called a Greco or Greco, but I, don't, I can't tell you when he plays it. Well, that's a real high pitched thing that, yeah, yeah. that you hear there, and it's very effective, isn't it? Uh, another piece of equipment, kind of unusual, the only other drummer I've seen uh, mount the cymbal that way was Ray McKinley. That's the upside down Chinese cymbal on the bass drum. Mm. So you don't have to reach off to the side, just reach straight ahead and hit hit the Chinese cymbal. And uh, Baduk made the, the most use of that uh, possible, I think. I really like the way he integrates the Chinese cymbal crashes into his, into his patterns. Uh, I think you guys are probably aware that he was one of Chick Webb's favorite drummers. Ah. I, I and, wasn't aware of that. Oh, well, he I was. Know, he Webb thought very highly of him. If you compare that solo to Harlem Congo, yeah. you'll hear, uh, I think, a lot of similarities. And I had a friend, a writer in uh, Switzerland named Johnny Simon, who visited with Kaiser Marshall when Kaiser Marshall was touring Europe. And uh, Johnny said, uh, who are the white drummers that you like in America? And the first guy that uh, Kaiser Marshall named was Ray Baduk. He said, he's a natural drummer. And you can sure hear that on there. It's so loose and so relaxed. It's driving, but it's uh, it's not over the top. Just every, everything he played was completely musical. And I hear little bits of, of Dodds as, as we hear on the, the talking records and also the solo records that uh, Zudi Singleton made, New Orleans Drums and Drum Face. There's, there's some elements from that. But uh, one other thing I noticed that, that was mentioned earlier was the stick on a stick on the mm -hmm. snare drum. One other guy I got to hear do that was Nick Fatul. And he put that on, on tags quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and we know that Wetling and, and uh, Cliff Lehman and, and others played it, but this is one of the great drum solo records of all times, as far as I'm concerned. And every time I hear it, I say, I think I'm going to go back to Kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> I hear <clears throat> that sort of New Orleans beat, obviously, from Ray Baduke, and it's very exciting. I, I can hear the sort of Dodds-ish things in there, but he's got an entirely different way of playing the blocks to Baby Dodds. Baby Dodds is unique. I hear, I think, a bit of Tony Spavaro in there as well. Uh, whether that's a, a deliberate thing or whether it's just that they grew up in the same place around the same time and they were all doing that sort of thing, I, I don't know. But I've always loved Ray's drumming. Um, reading in one of the Krupa books, Gene was remarking that both Ray Baduke and Ray McKinley were natural drummers. They weren't school drummers. They had this natural talent. And uh, I think that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And anything that Ray Baduke's on is worth hearing. Although I find him, like George Wetling, less interesting as we get into the 50s where he seems to give up playing the snare and the blocks and the rims and plays a lot of time on ride cymbal and that sort of thing. You were aware no, that he was a dancer too, right? Ah, no, I wasn't. Well, he was a very skilled dancer. And if you ever watched that uh, short of the Crosby band from 1938 and watch him play Pig and Love Song, he's doing a snake dance <laughs> behind uh, the drums on his solo where his, his head and his body are moving in different directions. There's a, a story from Norman Brownlee, the orchestra leader in New Orleans, that uh, was reprinted in this book uh, with the CD set, Cabaret Echoes, where he talks about a battle of the bands with a, a lesser known group that was actually winning the contest until Ray Baduk did his snake dance. And he got out from behind the drums and went through the, the auditorium doing his snake dance, got back on the stand, uh, huddled down behind the drum set that came up like a cobra and finished off a, a drum solo. And they won the contest just based on Ray Baduk. <laughs> Great uh, stuff. Uh, Any other comments on uh, Ray Baduk? Uh, that, that makes me love him even more. Like I, I, I didn't know that, but that, that's the kind of thing I, I love about 
but I, I like showmanship as, as long as it backed up with like good playing, you know, it's not really the only thing, but, and so I, I love that. Yeah. And like, I think it's, he, yeah, he's new, born New Orleans, wasn't he? But like, yeah. he's not, he's not, as you said, I think it's interesting that, that, that um, symbol on the bass drum, that's a hangover from marching. So obviously New Orleans thing, that's interesting. And he doesn't, he, if even if, so, even if he was around Baby and and Zuti, like, but he doesn't, he doesn't sound like them. But yeah, maybe a bit more like Babaro. So, like, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's a super interesting. It's really good. And that, that upside down Chinese symbol, like that, how you mentioned that that he had like that. I always love that because that's always a thing. I mean, not that I know anything about fusion drumming. Uh, that couldn't be further from anything I know about. <laughs> but I know that in that era. That's like in the 70s, that kind of became a thing that players in fusion bands would have Chinese symbols or Swiss symbols and they'd play them upside down and rock drummers kind of got into that. And if you see, not that a lot of rock drummers have a Chinese symbol, but when they do, it's usually upside down like that. And that was kind of the modern way to do it. But those guys had that back then. So And they also, uh, he mounted it on the cymbal spring. And I was actually looking for one of mine. I of them here and i've played that a couple of times when i've done the early odjb music and when you hit it it's just like target practice all of a sudden it starts moving all <laughs> you got to try to hit it right. next time so one good hit's good for it <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you jack for choosing that one of uh, one of my favorite tracks and uh, I, I i thoroughly enjoyed that and also the reflections of uh, of the paddle it's uh, it taught me a few things i didn't know Right, next, Hal, it's over to you next to introduce your track. We're going to hear Bob Zerke and his Delta Rhythm Band with a great Sterling Bowes on cornet and one of my favorite drummers, someone I think should be better known, and that's Stan King. He made many, many records, but he's not talked about in the same, uh, same breath as Gene Krupa or George Wetling or Dave Tuff. Maybe that's because he didn't make a transition to the swing era as easily as, as those other guys did. But what he played was just fantastic in the, in the 20s and 30s. He recorded with the California Ramblers, the Dorsey Brothers, uh, one great session that combined the Dorsey Brothers and McKinney's Cotton Pickers called the Big Aces and a, a couple sides with Miff Mole, like uh, You're the Cream in My Coffee, where he played wonderful syncopations against arranged syncopations that the, the whole orchestra was playing. And he went on to play with Tempo King and Bob Howard. And he also made wonderful records with the Boswell Sisters, where uh, once in a while you can hear, his, hear him coming up from, uh, from the rhythm section, like at the very end of Heebie Jeebies, where he's answering the, the phrases with, I uh, think Michael Brooks called them back flips on the, the, the press roll, it was kind of a reverse press roll that he was playing. But this is one of the records from the swing era after he had joined the uh, Bob Zerke band, where you can actually hear him play. Uh, it's not just buried in the rhythm section, he's playing really driving press rolls and doing kind of a similar to what we just heard Ray Baduke do, where he's playing on the rims and the cowbells, along with Bob Zerke's very busy piano style. And it, it's very effective. Uh, you can also hear some of his uh, wonderful backflip press roll, and it sounds like he's just got one cymbal, and it, it's got a wonderful tone when he, when he crashes it. But this is one of my favorite Stan King records, and I was pleased that all of you guys liked it when you heard it too. But this is... Um, Sounds like a Dean Kincaid arrangement, but I don't know that he actually wrote for, for Zerky. This might be a Fudd Livingston arrangement in the style of uh, Dean Kincaid, but this is I Found a New Baby with Stan King on drums. <laughs> Thank you. 
any other comments before we hand it over? I love the uh, rip shots that he played, the afterbeat rim shots at just the right point behind Sterling Bowes there, and that very fast triplet that he played on the snare near the, the end of the ensemble. But the rest of it, I what I'd mentioned earlier, I, he's a proactive player. He was making it hot right from the start with those press rolls. Uh, a friend, someone that several of us know, David Sager, a great trombonist, was... I'm trying to remember where this happened. I think it may have been at a union hall where he was talking to an older musician and he mentioned Stan King and another older musician was walking by and stopped and turned around and said, Stan King, best press rolls in the business. <laughs> there they were. <laughs> it just made that whole thing go. Josh, what have you got to say about that? Oh, it's just beautiful. Yeah, I love I love Stan King's playing. And as I agree with Hal, is that his name should be out there a lot more. And um, there's there, there's been a lot that I've been trying to uncover re a lot recently with Stan King, trying to find out like more history about him, like where does he come from, and, and a lot of that. And sometimes the the personal history isn't out there as much as the musical history because I'm always interested in who they were as a person as well because that goes into their playing and and like what makes a person play like that. And I, I have to agree when you hear Stan King doing those press rolls, but then doing the accents in there and it's so smooth and beautiful. That's one thing you don't hear that many musicians behind the drums doing anymore. It's just a straight on press roll for their entire solo and then going back. And I've done that a couple of times. And then the audience says, well, why aren't you doing more on the drums? I'm like, I, I have all I need right here in front of me. I can get as much music out of this one drum as I can the entire kit. And that's what I hear with Stan King. When you hear those press rolls, it just, sent, again, sends chills. Like, wow, that sounds incredible. Yeah, I mean, the the best press roll in the business, that's not, I can't really argue with it. I mean, that, that it, it's so hard to put into words exactly sometimes what makes a drummer great. But when you hear that recording, as soon as it starts, one bar in, you know, oh, this is a great drummer. Just from where the time is and the feel and the sound he's getting on that snare drum, many drummers, technically what he's doing at the beginning, just like the basic press roll, is not technically a difficult thing in terms of what it actually is. But to get it to sound like that, just it's the same as when you hear of someone playing a hi-hat and we can all just play a hi-hat. But if, it, if you start out and it's Joe Jones, you instantly hear, oh, this is a great drummer. And that's what that recording uh, made me think of. And, I, and he does another thing. One of my favorite sounds that a lot of the players back then would do would be a, a cymbal crash with a rim shot on the snare drum at the same time. I just, I just love that sound. It's such a powerful sound. And the way he was sort of interacting with what the band was playing with some cymbal crashes kind of in between phrases that they were doing, it, it was fantastic. And yeah, Hal just proactive, just, just swinging the band. And Hal, you actually hipped me to this recording uh, not too long ago. I didn't know about it before uh, you shared it with me and you've hipped me to many great recordings. So I, I appreciate that. And this, I, I must admit, I'm overall not I haven't heard as much Stan King as I have, let's say, someone like Ray Baduke. But, mm. but this recording, when you first shared this with me, it was really an eye opener because the other things I heard him on, he obviously sounded great. But then this was even on another level. And um, forgive my ignorance, but when did he die? How long did he live? Because I can't really think of much of him from really after this that I know about. I think he died in 1949, I think. And that would mean he, he was about, he was less than 50 years old when he passed away, right. I think. Right. Yeah, because you just hear this and again, yeah, this, this player should be better known. And I was just so curious, you know, what he, what he would have kept doing, you know, just the way these different players change and, and to hear them even once you know, high fidelity came in, you know, to have had that chance with, with someone like this would have been amazing. When you hear his records with Tempo King and Bob Howard, with both of which were small combinations, basically imitating what Fats Waller was playing with the same instrumentation and saying, yes, yes, and, and encouragement like that while the other solos were going on. Stan King played the same way. 
as as we heard on here, lots of press rolls, and there's a, a Bob Howard record where he gets a solo over the rhythm. Rhythm keeps playing, like like you and I played solos with Jim Cullum, where the rhythm section kept playing and we had to play over it. And it's anything but swing drumming. It it sounds like it's from 1916 with the big cowbell and the and the blocks and the random hits on the tom toms and all that. I love it but it's definitely not part of the swing era. And I think he was probably playing in studios, mostly into the forties if, uh, if he wasn't at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I gotta say, I, I love that. What you just described, I always love hearing different players who just do their thing and maintain their identity, even if they're kind of in a different situation. And I like sometimes when things don't exactly go together and I know we're, we're going to hear uh, a Gene Krupa recording, and, and he's another great example. He could play the ride cymbal with Bix in 1930, or he could play press rolls behind a bebop horn player in the 50s. <laughs> he's just doing his thing, and I, I, I just love it. As long as it's swinging and it sounds good, you know, I, I think there's no reason why uh, a press roll or any of those sounds have to die out. You know, keep it going. I like things that don't exactly make sense as long as it's swinging. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I purposely didn't listen to these songs before we did this, but that, that was amazing. I'm not aware of Bob Zirk, is it? Or Zirky, whatever you say it. Bob Zirky. But, um, but yeah, I, I want to be on the hit list with Kevin now, if, you, if that's the kind of stuff you're sending out. That's amazing. When was that recorded? That's 1939. That, that, that quality was amazing. And like that, the quality of the band as well. Like There was a lot of later influence stuff here. That... There's, I think there's more interesting arrangement ideas in that than in like the Benny Goodman band, which is the same, the same era, you know, like, and I get like, um, and I, yeah, I agree with Kevin as well, like mixes of, mixes of sounds on there, like, like Ray Badukin and that, like, um, played on the, on the woodblock or the shell of the bass drum on that first piano break or solo as well. And then we're like, oh no, no, I don't like that. Went back to the stair drum. But then, uh, but then later on, and then you, is that, that's that Greco symbol you were saying about then? You could hear that the second piano solo towards the end. Really That's clearly, very, I think. yeah, very possible, or else it's a really high pitched cowbell. Yeah, potentially, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna so look up more of that. That was yeah, really exciting. And again, so like everyone goes on about like Krupa being this like what like one of these main backbeat guys because he's bringing a better beat in the last chorus. That's backbeat basically in from the beginning and basically mm. throughout the song, apart from backing the quieter solos. I think that's really forward thinking as well. You know, like that's uh, that that's giving me a reaction. The same one to. Um, Oh, there's another big, there's another, oh, sorry, I wouldn't forget, it's embarrassing for you guys. I've got that in a band, but uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy Crawford plays with, uh, Lunsford, Jimmy Lunsford. Yeah. But, um, I wasn't really aware of that band. And then I heard a recording of that somewhere and I was like, wow, this band's amazing. They're, they sound so much better than some of the other bands in the era. And like, what? Well, or I mean, technically better. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like the arrangements, I mean, like in a in a, a clean more chicago style way of playing i mean like but um so yeah so just thanks so much for introducing me to that that's amazing lovely well i i, I heard nothing of any hi-hats or ride cymbal rhythms or anything through that at all <laughs> which considering it's 1939 is interesting because most of the drummers by that time had latched on to that sort of way of playing but here we've got this old style that's going right the way through the piece and like you said Hal those backbeats the offbeat rims and that sort of thing it's wonderful stuff and there ain't nothing wrong with a press roll. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say. The next piece is the track that I've chosen. Um, boy, was this a hard job. And I considered lots and lots of different things. I had to have a Krupa track in this presentation because I think he was such an important drummer. And it was a question of which to pick. Now, I've gone for this because it's a live situation. It's 1944, so it's the time when he was probably at the peak of his playing abilities. It's a time when the music was in transition, so we're just on the edge of what's about to explode on the scene with bebop. And Krupa is the big star swing drummer, but he's gone back to his roots in Chicago and he's playing what I would call perfect Chicago-style drums with a mixture of swing drumming as well. 
And what you hear at the beginning is you hear some closed hi-hat behind the piano. And then you hear a mixture of mostly press rolls, a lot of rim shots, a lot of tom-tom punctuations, a lot of off beats. Uh, behind the trombone solo, you hear him play ride cymbal. And then you get the solo where he constructs two choruses and they make absolute sense and it's almost like a call and response pattern he's playing a phrase and then almost answering his own phrase again and then you get the ride out couple of choruses and then he goes for three four bar breaks at the end and there's all sorts of little patterns going on here there's this interplay between the bass drum and the cymbal which he does numerous times there's the solo is mostly, I would guess, paradiddles and single, single triplets mostly between the snare and the tom tom. And it's just exciting, hot music. So, this is Carnegie Leap or Ensemble Blues from the Eddie Condon Town Hall concert in 1944. Gene, you want to take this right away? You want to take it? Got it. Yes. Joe Marcello from the Hickory House. The music's good and so are the stakes. Charlie Ellsworth Russell. Bobby Haggard. He's down at next. All Go ahead, Bobby.
back next week. <laughs> Sid Weiss and his bass, Ernie Caceres, Bobby Hackett, Pee Wee Russell, Maxie Kaminsky, and Gene Schrader, but only for a week. So plan to stand by next week at the same time for some more of the same. And by the way, we're getting ready a big batch of special new pictures of your favorite pinup boy, and mine too, Charles Ellsworth, Pee Wee Russell, the Nijinsky of the clarinet, the extremely thin man of swing. So if you want a picture of Pee Wee to paste in your helmet or to tack up over your chiffonier, and no home is really complete without one, just drop a line to Eddie Condon, the Blue Network, Radio City, New York 20. Who wants to kick this off? Yeah, uh, I, I again, I don't really know. I know those recordings. I don't know them really well, but I had, um, I listened to them all. And like, I had, I had uh, all the Eddie Condon live gigs. Like, um, I had, I think I had like a ridiculous amount of miles of him one, in one weekend at all these gigs. And I was like, right. <laughs> I'm going to listen to these recordings and it, and it was great. Like, um, but what I know about it is just Cooper, maybe, <clears throat> I mean, I'm pretty familiar with his stuff. He was like one of the first guys that I got into this stuff, but I think he's one of the best like signature drummers. It's like, he's got a lot of, you know what I mean? A signature licks, like patterns. He, he goes, like, and that king, 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 king. Like he's got these signature licks that like, most of his solos are made up of and I, I love it but like it's when you when you when you're used to hearing them you're like oh he's doing he's doing that lick. oh he's doing that lick. oh it's that lick the solo is made up of these signatures so like but it's mega exciting isn't it and i think that's in, what what year did you say that was late 40s or oh, mid mid 40s yeah. but like he you can hear then he's even a bit influenced by bebop and stuff then there's a lot more bomb what the bombs dropped then than like in some of the earlier stuff and he's um so it's like i think it's interesting he does he is edging a bit more that way even though i you know i prefer it when he's not doing that i mean it's fine where he is there but some of the later recordings when he's trying to play a bit more bebop i don't really like it that much but um yeah i i mean i think it's great in there and I, I like all the again i like the, the old the, those old programs with the um the announcers going through and i like that he tells you the uh the players and there's a great um it's a benny goodman one for camel cigarettes do you know that recording that um it's like a TV broadcast, and it's hilarious because of the. Well, I'm well, sorry, we've got three Americans with us now, but they're all, all the voice. So I, I love hearing it. it takes you like those old recordings. He's like, "Have a camel cigarette," and they're now sponsored by Benny Goodman, and it's on these recordings, and it's. Uh, so I, I love hearing all the all that old stuff on it as well. Lovely, uh, Josh. What did you make of that recording? Oh, I, I loved it. Um, I've heard a lot of the, the town hall music there, and it's uh, again, it's typical Krupa. I mean, you can just hear as soon as the drums start in, he has that signature snare sound. He has, as Jack mentioned, he's got that bass drum with the bombs that drop in there. Um, but I know there's a bunch of videos where you can actually see him doing that riff um, with that da -da 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 -da, and he's, he's starting on the edge of the drum and then pulling back to be able to get that volume to come out of the snare there. So he really knew how to master that snare drum. Um, and I, and I know I should probably bring up the name of Roy Knapp. I know he took lessons with Roy Knapp and a lot of those great drummers that they studied with him and just having that style and sound. I mean, yeah, it's 
as soon as you hear it within the first couple of seconds, you're like, if, if you don't think it's Krupa, then you're going to be assuming it is Krupa. Um, <laughs> so in demand for his playing. But um, I like how Kevin mentioned, too, is here's somebody that's evolved through the years. I mean, starting with McKenzie, McKenzie and Condon Chicagoans and then evolving and going into the, the bebop music is, um, I mean, Charlie Ventura is another one I, I think of with saxophone. I mean, he was so great with Krupa, but then he took off in his own career. And I love listening to his material. So I think Krupa was one of them, kind of how Big Sid Catlett also evolved. And there are these drummers that they knew that if they wanted to keep working, it's evolving with the times, it's this new style. They wanted to keep with it. But there were some that were, um, they want to stay more like a 20s or 30s style, maybe not evolve as much. And that's where, that was the personal preference of each musician. But I like how Krupa could evolve and you can hear how his playing evolves through the years like that. Well, even though his playing continued to evolve, it, uh, it always had the older elements in it. He never forgot his roots. And that's, that's the thing I love the most about Gene Krupa. I mean, you can hear him on a TV show in the 70s and he's still playing for lack of a better term, Chicago style. <laughs> and uh, Dick Wellstead commented on that. He said, whenever I saw Gene's head go down, he went back to Chicago in 1927. <laughs> and that, of course, that's fine with me. You know, I'll take that 24-7. Uh, I also noticed that Gene cranked up the, uh, the intensity behind Pee Wee's solo there. And it reminded me, somebody talked to Pee Wee, Russell one time about playing with Krupa and he said, you got to play better with Gene. He insists. <laughs> and he was, he was doing a lot of insisting on, on that <laughs> solo. And I, I appreciate uh, the, all the mention of his signature licks on there. And there's also that um, three against four on the, the bass drum and the cymbal. And you notice he displaced it a couple of times and didn't, didn't play it exactly the same way that we're used to hearing someone like Chick Webb play it or, or Big Sid. We, I think when most of us have played it or heard it, it's been boom, ch -ch, boom, ch -ch, boom, ch -ch. and he did it slightly different. The same idea, but just the beat in a different place, and it was very effective. Well, that, that's a great track to choose to illustrate Gene Krupa. That's all, all the good things about Krupa's playing on there for me. I can hear, of course, the, the Zuti influences and things like that with some of those patterns that you were talking about as well, Hal. Mm -hmm. There's one other from this series. It's the Gershwin program where the band is playing I Got Rhythm and Krupa plays a whole chorus on choke cymbal, after beat choke cymbal. <laughs> and nobody was doing that in 1944 except uh, Baduke. With, uh, with Crosby, and Sid had done it a little earlier on Pound Ridge with the uh, Benny Goodman Orchestra, but just didn't hear choke cymbal unless uh, it was an older style band, but it's very effective, and, and that's one of the few um, instances I can think of of a later recording where Gene is playing that, and he just played it to perfection. I think that's, the, yeah, I agree. That's such a perfect recording to illustrate everything that Gene Krupa could do, and I think I always love hearing him in any context, and he played in such a with such a variety of people over the years. But whenever you can hear him with Eddie Condon over the years, whenever they got together, mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite situations to hear Gene Krupa in. Just everything he does works so perfectly. He sounds so comfortable, and the way he was driving the soloists, and yeah, that that lick that Hal you were talking about. I think a couple people mentioned he does that kind of like um ga ga um ga ga. Or he'll do it between the bass drum and the stick shot or the bass drum and cymbal. And he kind of plays it, I think, three times on there. He sort of yeah. did it between the stick and the bass drum, um, I think, under Bobby Hackett. And then he kind of did it with the bass drum and the cymbal. Maybe it was under Jonah Jones. And then he did it in one of his tags. But yeah, kind of slightly different each time. But that's, that's to me, maybe the number one signature Gene Krupa lick. I always love hearing him do that. Um, he did a thing also at the very beginning, that's something that I've noticed with a lot of drummers back then that has maybe kind of gone away when there's the piano intro and the drums just kind of sneak in. You'll hear that a lot where maybe the piano starts and then the drums just kind of come in, but they don't really come in. Okay, I'll wait four bars and then really come in with an accent. They just kind of sneak in. And I just always love that. You hear that a lot. People don't really do that today. And 
and maybe I would caution drummers, unless you're Gene Krupa, maybe don't go for a third four bar tag because the band will not be happy. <laughs> There's a lot of things that Gene Krupa could do that us mortals, maybe not. I notice also behind Jonah Jones, he was playing the hi-hat open, got a rim shot going uh, along with it as well. That's that, uh, another thing. That's the sort of thing Big Sid used to do as well quite a bit. The whole performance was dynamic. It was interesting because he was changing things around. You've got a different texture behind each soloist, which is following what Baby Dodds recommended in his talking records. He's, he's talking about playing different behind a clarinet and behind a trumpet and that sort of thing. You've given something different to work on. And I think that's what was happening there as well. I think it's funny as well, hearing that compared to the last three drummers we've heard as well. He's very assertive, uh, what did Hal say? Uh, very assertive or even aggre like aggressive. He's, he basically puts some kind of answer every four bars in that. And that is a live situation as well. But like, it's uh, it's quite interesting hearing it in context to that as well. It's very, um, yeah, very strong in his musical opinions. Yeah, and he pulls it off as well every time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is not a criticism. It's just yeah. like, it's just interesting. He's like, yeah, it's like, very strong, yeah. I was going to wonder about that, like the tag on the end. I was like, oh, I wonder how many were actually planned. Was that him just doing that? But yeah, you think that was just come up with it on the moment? I, 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 I don't know. I suppose uh, it, it, it felt right, so it got put in. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's, it's very exciting and it all came together. But the interesting thing about his, his playing press roles, there's a video that you can find on YouTube of him with that bebop band on a, a real up-tempo number. I can't remember what, it, what it's called. And he's playing press roles right through that. And I think that's that's good. And I think he got messed up by bebop. There's a period in the probably the very early 50s where he's trying to, you know, sort of get that fragmented bass drum beat going. And it tends to sound a little bit uncomfortable for a while. And it takes him a few years to work through that and get it back together again. I feel like, yeah, maybe, maybe it's like, I, I think you can kind of compare it with like Louis Armstrong a bit in that you kind of move, you move forward at a time so much. And then you think like, oh no, this isn't, this isn't for me now. I'm going to go back to doing what I like. And like, and, and I, you know, I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but yeah, I agree with you, I think, John. But yeah, he had some physical ailments too, John. You know, he had to uh, sit a little hot in the angle of the snare drum and all that all that bending over was was injuring his spine and mm. that will affect your, your bass drum foot too. So I, I think the later we hear him play, the less we hear that boom, 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 boom that, that we like so much from... Uh, from the earlier eras, because it was just too painful for him to do. You, you notice on that last performance of the uh, Goodman Quartet, they have George Duvivier yeah. added on string bass. I think part of that's because, I hope I won't be roasted by Krupa fans on this, but I think he was having trouble playing those fast tempos in 4-4, and they needed something to make sure there was going to be a bottom there for that that particular performance yeah there's some video of them rehearsing for i don't know if it's for that particular concert he looks like he's at death's door doesn't he have you i'm sure you've seen that mm -hmm. yeah he still swings like a demon <laughs> i think that's one of the sad things about the the famous drum battle as well in that like if you don't understand what cooper did for drumming and like and how Great. There's that quote, isn't it? But Buddy, I mean, Buddy was a big fan of Gene, wasn't he? But it said, I, I can hit eight symbols in the time it takes um, Gene to hit one, but he'll get a bigger round of applause. <laughs> Not everyone will be looking at him, you know, like, but um, I think it's a shame that, that that famous recording that a lot of, if you like Buddy Rich fans find, it looks like he plays all over him, really, but he's not in good health in that. And it's a shame that that's such a famous recording of him not in his prime, really. Louis Belson said that in, in that drum video that came out some years ago that him and Buddy were doing all these very complicated things and yet Gene could just wow them just with a single stroke roll or something like that. I, I was just going to add to that point. Um, when I was in high school, uh, so, you know, I was fortunate to be growing up here in New York. So there were a lot of great jazz drummers to go here and I tried to go hear everyone I could in just whatever style. And I remember one time I went to hear Max Roach, but I was wearing a Gene Krupa t-shirt. 
cool. And he, and he saw it and he got so excited and you've got the man on your shirt. And he talked to me for a minute and he was telling me, I, I can't remember so long ago. I can't remember all the details, but he was telling me about some get together of drummers, I guess it was at a festival where they would each come out and play a solo. And, you know, he said, I forget who was there, but Max Roach was there, maybe Louis Belson, Elvin Jones, just like a ton of people. And Max Roach was saying, yeah, you know, we all were trying to outdo each other. And we were all doing our most technical drum stuff. And he said, Gene Krupa came out and he schooled all of us because he started playing and he was the only one of us. He started playing and the people in the audience kind of started moving to it. Yeah. And yeah, he, said we, and he said, we all realized, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. You got it, Gene. You know, we, we messed up. That's, that's what he said to me, which I thought was a, was a wow. beautiful thing. And, and all those guys that I got to meet for a second from that era, they were such fans of these drummers. I never met any of those bebop or whatever drummers who ever put down any of these guys. They were all just absolutely enthralled with them and could not have been bigger fans of them, which was very nice to see. Yeah, and I think also what uh, comes across from what you read of people, uh, people's comments, he was a genuinely nice guy as well. Very, very approachable. Uh, there are all sorts of people with anecdotes that actually met him that you know, testify to that. And I think that comes out in his playing as well. You're in the seat now, Kevin. Tell us about your choice. Okay. Um, so I picked Cliff Lehman and... Cliff Lehman is one of my very favorite drummers. And this is a recording. It's a little bit later. This is, I think, from 1964, Eddie Condon in Japan. And when I was first getting into this music, I heard Cliff Lehman on a tape that someone had made me that was a compilation of different Eddie Condon recordings, but it wasn't labeled. So I didn't know who any of these people were. So I was listening to this and I was thinking, oh, I love this drummer, and this, but I didn't know who it was. And then when I found out it was Cliff Lehman, of course, I went out and I tried to find more recordings of his. And this was, I think, the first one I got. And this is a little bit different. I, I like so many. One of the things that I love about this music most is how many ways there are to play it. It's, it's infinite. And all of us here, although we might all fall under the category of traditional jazz drummers, we're all different from each other. And these players that we're listening to, although they would all fall under maybe that same broad category, they're so different from each other. And I also, just the way that I came to the music, I never personally really associated it with any era. So somebody like Gene Krupa or Joe Jones or Nick Fatul or George Wetling, whoever, I love them in the 30s. I love them in the 1960s or beyond. There might be some things that I like more than others, mm. but I just really love everything about them. So here, Cliff Lehman, he just has such a unique style. This is kind of the opposite of some of the things we've been listening to, because here he's really on the cymbal the entire time through the whole recording, even when he's trading fours with the bass, I think he's playing the cymbal and he does an intro on the cymbal. And even that is unusual because usually if drummers are going to play a time intro, it's maybe on the hi-hat, but he's just on the cymbal. He also does some great little things with a splash cymbal, which is a nice contrast to these bigger cymbals that he's playing. And it's just this real driving time. And there's not a lot of changing it up, but to me, the groove is so great. And sometimes he'll even go from one soloist to another without really marking it in any way, without playing an accent or a fill, just the time just kind of goes and someone else starts, which can be a nice effect. And the fours he trades with Jack Lesberg on bass, I mean, the way Cliff Lehman played, they just don't really sound like drum patterns or rudimental patterns. They're pretty avant-garde. And a lot of recordings where he's trading fours, he'll accent weird beats or start and end his phrases in weird places where you almost think, wait, did they turn the beat around or did he get off? But then no, but it's just so weird. And then he does a great four bar tag at the end, just a classic Cliff Lehman really going for it kind of tag. And then he kind of keeps soloing through the last four bars of the band, which he would also do a lot. And then I love how the ending is just not clean at all. And it's just talking about different combinations of people. I think the front line is Buck Clayton, Vic Dickinson, Pee Wee Russell, and Bud Freeman. So it's just one of these, 
I've just always really been drawn to things where it's not so clear to say, well, wait, what kind of style is this? Mm. And it's just kind of like, I don't know. It's just swinging. So that's what I like about this track. Okay. This is I Would Do Anything For You with Eddie Condon's band in Japan. I would do most anything for you. Kevin, do you want to uh, add, add anything to that before we chuck it around the panel? Just that I just love his time and his feel. And I just think it presents the horn players in such a, a good way. It just really seems to give them a chance to really get swinging. And it's, it's just kind of uncluttered. And he sort of just lays down this kind of nice blanket for them to play over. And they all sound very inspired. I thought that was really interesting actually. I don't I don't know that recording and I don't know that drummer to be honest. But like 
was so from what I understand those Eddie Condon concerts were they they were like put together as kind of like package tours right so they weren't necessarily a band they got a group of musicians and they went on tour yeah yeah so I wonder like that that felt like they were still made me feeling each other out but I feel like that who was on bass for that do you know Jack Lesberg were they I wonder if I felt like they I felt like he was maybe um pu- pu- like pulling back and, and the drummer was pushing forward on that um a bit so i wonder where that was in in the tour or something i i felt i thought that was a really interesting feel amongst them then and as you said like really interesting mix of i feel like there's like bebop influences there but then also like yeah that that splash splash symbol stuff is very not bebop and like yeah really really interesting mix of stuff there and as you said like that those trades were were stri- like yeah definitely pulling the beat around a bit and like very fun i bet that was really fun to play on like you could tell but um yeah, really interesting, really interesting recording. Josh. Yeah, I love the feel. And I mean, something, I mean, since there's no video of what it looks like there, um, I, I agree with Kevin. He just drives the swing feel. I mean, and that rhythm section was just chugging. And I can't help but wonder if at times he even had his left hand doing fours on the snares very lightly, very similar to like what Zudi would do when he's swinging on those early records in the 40s. And Zudi's on that, on the right symbol in that left hand on mm. the snares. Ding, 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 ding. it just has this pulse to it and when i'm listening to that i'm like like visualizing that with him behind the drums just just pulsating and swinging it like that but again my i can't see what his left hand was doing there but i would almost assume that i'm sure at some point he's probably doing something like that to really swing the heck out of the band you know kevin there's a historical precedent for starting the the tune off with playing on the ride cymbal instead of the hi-hat Chick Webb did that. Back Bay Shuffle. And I've read that sometimes Webb would bring the band, the whole band in by just playing time on the cymbal instead of the hi-hat or, or a snare drum intro or something like that. That's the first thing I thought when I heard that cymbal. I said, ah, Chick Webb. Because he, Chick Webb was one of uh, Cliff Lehman's mentors, as was Big Sid. Uh, and I have to think there, he must have listened to Dave Tuff, too, with all those splash cymbal accents just in the right spot they're they're wonderful the thing i like the most about this particular performance actually that whole recording of of the condon group in japan is how when he gets on the cymbals right away it just starts shimmering underneath the the whole band it's a wonderful cushion and it keeps everything moving forward but it's ah Shimmer is the only word I can I can think of. It gets such a marvelous sound out of all the symbols, and everybody seems to react to it the right way. Everybody sounds inspired when they've got that going on underneath. And two other people that who we admire that I think did that extremely well. Actually, three: George Wetling in the fifties on the the Condon Columbia records basically stayed on the symbol once it once he got on it and would bring different tones out of it and different dynamics and all that but it really made the band move along and and gave it everything it needed earlier dave tough with woody herman getting on the cymbals especially the chinese symbol and just making a whole side move along just from the cymbals and later jake hannah when especially in a small combination like this anytime he'd play traditional jazz or, or older style swing you get on uh, one of his ride cymbals or the chinese cymbals that have that same kind of shimmer that that cliff lehman has here I, I think that's an excellent choice to illustrate just how musical cliff lehman could be especially with a, a band like this it's kind of too bad that wild bill wasn't here because mm-hmm. cliff lehman was his favorite drummer for very good reason as you can hear here I'll second that because when while Bill was over here, I was talking to him about the This Is Jazz recordings with Baby Dodds. And I was, of course, also asking him about the sessions that he did with Krupa. And I actually played in the Bonaparte's Retreat with that country singer on there. And he hadn't heard it for for 50 years. <laughs> and he remembered that session. So I said, well, who, who was your favorite drummer? And he said, Cliff Lehman. That surprised me a little, but yeah, I can understand why. Never played anything wrong. It was always at the service of the music, and it always supported 
soloist and it kept the rhythm going and his time was immaculate. When did he pass away? He was, was he around fairly late on? I, I have a suspicion he was. He died, I think, in 1986, if yeah. I recall. I never got to see him. That was before uh, I was playing drum, but um, I think he died in 1986. I have gotten to meet his widow. who's a very nice woman. She still lives in New Jersey. But just uh, just great swinging time. And I've just always been in the same way, you know, we're talking before, you could have different drummers play a press roll through an entire tune, but they're not going to sound the same. And, uh, you know, some people think, oh, he's just playing on the cymbal, but it's just, that doesn't sound like anyone but Cliff Lehman. And it sounds very in the moment. And and how you just mentioned uh, Jake Hanna, and that was something I, I meant to say before when we were talking I think about wording. And I can't remember... Jack, it may have been you, I can't remember who said it, but someone was commenting, maybe it was Josh, someone was commenting on how it was just this straight time on the snare drum and he didn't need to do a lot on the tom-toms or anything. I always think about Jake. Jake wouldn't even use tom-toms by the time I met him and saw him. He just played with a snare drum, a bass drum, and the cymbals. And it wasn't out of laziness that he didn't want to carry stuff because I saw him at festivals where they provided a full drum set and he would take the tom-toms off the set <laughs> and put them backstage. <laughs> and I just always really liked that too, because if you just have that kind of setup, you're really saying, hey, I'm just here to swing. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just trying to play a groove for the band. So I always liked that approach as well. Wonderful stuff. Well, folks, this has been a most enjoyable discussion this evening. As I said earlier, I've I've learned loads and it's inspired me to do a bit more listening, I think. Mm. Me too. Oh, it's, it's, it's all wonderful music. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is it just it gets the gears going. You hear something and then you want to go down that rabbit hole. What, what else is out there that you're listening to? So my thanks to Kevin Dawn. Uh, Josh Duffy, Jack Amblin, and Hal Smith. And guys, keep swinging. Sounds you great. Too. <laughs> really fun, John. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, Thank guys. You. Take care. Okay. Yeah, have a good one. Bye.